Good evening. Welcome everybody to, to the uh, webinar on cervical degenerative myelopathy. Well, the presenter is Nananda Nana, president of our NESON, an active spine neurosurgeon who had been um, tremendously working in this field. Uh, degenerative cervical myelopathy, even though not a new entity for all of us, has been changing its definition over the years. And as per the protection of WHO, in the next 30 years, age of the people more than 60 years, if in case we count those people, then it's going to double from 11% to 22%. And henceforth, the degenerative cervical myelopathy is going to be much more commoner. Uh, so this is a very new uh, uh, a field with a very new definitions coming up. And uh, let's hear what Dr. Krishna has to say on this topic. And uh, if there is any question, uh, we will like to keep it on the chat box and we'll discuss it uh, uh, um, much more in detail. And with my co-moderator, Dr. Pratyush, uh, let me invite you all again on this webinar. So over to Dr. Krishna. So please start. Thank you very much. Uh, namaste to everybody. Uh, today my topic is degenerative cervical myelopathy. Uh, it is the most common cause of spinal cord impairment in adults worldwide. And it is important and growing public health problem as more, uh, over 70% of the individuals is more than 65 years would have some kind of a cervical degenerative myelopathy. And of all the non-traumatic spinal cord injury, the degenerative condition accounts for almost more than 50% in North America and Japan. And it's followed uh, in a similarly by Australia, Europe. We don't have a data of Asia, but uh, we have to work on this. The resultant burden of the disability in our society is expected to grow as the aging global population grows. And by the data uh, uh, from 2010 to 2015, those patients of more than 65 would have increased from 13 to 22%. And we expect a similar rise of this DCM, degenerative cervical myelopathy, in that particular ratio. Now, if you look at the hospitalization ratio also, the data from Taiwan and USA says that almost four to eight per lakh population uh, um, population are hospitalized because of the uh, DCM. And even the surgical case volumes, almost 2% of the surgical volumes are occupied by the uh, volume. If we quickly go through the pathogenesis, uh, cervical degenerative myelopathy, which could be congenitally acquired or combined, effects by a mechanical compression or a vascular compression or is causing ischemia or a com combination of these two effects. The compression could be static or dynamic. In the static, in already a, a stenosed canal the, with an age-related osteoarthritis, this could be, this could be osteophytes formation, this could be OPLL or deformed. In a dynamic one, the main uh, culprit is hyperextension. However, though in a physiological movement, this uh, patient will cause uh, uh, injury to uh, acute traumatic spinal cord injury to an already compromised uh, cord, resulting into a central cord syndrome. Now, the vascular compromise is ischemia. There is a term uh, like in brain, it is blood spinal cord barrier. So this barrier is disrupted during, uh, due to the inflammation and ischemia. The walls are thickened, so there is already an ischemia, and there is mechanical stress as well as increased uh, flow velocity. So it affects all the uh, spinal cord by different uh, methods. And with this, there's a release of a lot of substances in a pathobiological process. There's a microvascular structure change. There is microglial or macrophage activation and into uh, neuroinflammation and ultimately an apoptosis where there is neuronal and oligodendroglial cells, uh, cells death causing demyelination. The uh, two things I would like to highlight is fast receptor. What has been found is that the blockade of the fast signaling pathway can reduce apoptosis, inflammation, and uh, promote axonal repair. So this could be one receptor of an interest uh, to, for a viable neuroprotective uh, strategy in future. There is almost uh, uh, another um, uh, substance called glutamate, which is 
uh, released by uh, calcium influx into the cell by activation of the sodium calcium exchange pump. So when there is increased uh, is glutamate uh, release, there is impaired intracellular energy metabolism. So these are the two key places where intervention can be done and uh, the spinal cord injury could be lessened, prevented or reversed. Now this is a histopathological feature. I don't want to go into detail of this. Now OPLL, though is included in DCM, it is almost a very uh, unique entity itself. There is ectopic calcification and ossification of the posterior long tail ligament. The precise uh, pathophysiology still is unclear, though it is multifactorial. And there's a lot of papers that talk about the interplay between genetic and environmental factors. The uh, how it affects is that again a mechanical compression, ischemia, and it can induce instability. The genetic susceptibility of DCM is a very low quality uh, evidence uh, so far. However, there are all these uh, genetic factors are being implicated. But what we have to understand is that most of these factors affect the structural component of the spine. So uh, mainly the bone morphogenic protein and so on. With an exception that there is one exception of encoded apolipoprotein E, which is this, which neural injury of the spinal cord by transporting cholesterol. So this again could be the gene that could be manipulated in recovery of the uh, spinal cord uh, in this area. Now, diagnosis has to be quick and in a simple way because earlier you do a diagnosis, you can avoid permanent disability of the cord. And also it is very, very important to rule out differential diagnosis because there are so many of them. And there has to be an agreement between the clinical finding, the neurophysiological case, and the imaging findings in, in order to finish the diagnosis of DCM. Now, a very careful history and physical examination is necessary because uh, myelopathy has to be diagnosed. Because when you, uh, in the subsequent talk, we will understand that it is very, very important to diagnose uh, myelopathy early and correctly uh, in order to have an expected result. And we have to rule out alternate diagnosis. And the management of radiculopathy and myelopathy is totally different. So this has to be borne in mind. The main presentation would be pain, a progressive disability with deformity and a neurological deficit. These are all the other um, uh, symptoms and signs which I don't want to go into detail because we are all aware of this. Now the assessment uh, is done. And the most uh, widely used uh, assessment mode is modified Japanese orthopedic association scale. Though it was initially, uh, start, I mean, this scale was used in Japan. This has been also uh, modified in available in Indian and other uh, population. So far, no Nepalese uh, spine surgeon has modified to their uh, need, but I think we can follow the Indian ones. There are 18 uh, scores mainly the motor uh, of the upper and lower, the sensory disturbance in the bowel and bladder. And uh, uh, the, it is divided into mild, moderate, and severe according to the score. This is the total table. There is another uh, uh, grading system called Nuri grading system, which is now it's less and less used because of its low sensitivity and poor responsiveness. There are many other clinical assessment tools which are enumerated here. But uh, most of them are still using the uh, modified Japanese uh, orthopedic scale. Now, there are other objective assessment uh, tools, something like guide right and grasp M. However, these require specialized equipment and time consuming. This is for theoretic and other. I don't think anybody is using so far. Now, imaging, there are um, most of us know and are using all these modalities of uh, imaging. And we have to understand that x-ray is the is the most important starting mode of uh, 
investigation because it will show the bony anatomy because we are mainly concentrating on the correction of the bony anatomy. So uh, it will show the degenerative disc joints, narrowing canals, and what is uh, and uh, vertebral fusion alignment, and even dynamic one. We can know the instability of this one. CT scan is uh, shows everything that is shown in the X-ray better, uh, and CT myelography is done where the MRI could not be done. Of course, MRI uh, is the gold standard to see the, all the structures, ligaments, cords and other soft issues. I don't, we don't have to go into detail about the convenience MRI. So I'll skip uh, those changes now. Now, the latest is a microstructural MRI, which is an emerging next generation quantitative microstructural MRI technique, which has improved our ability to image the spinal cord and quantify the degree of tissue injury so that we know uh, uh, we can quantify the spinal cord tissue damage and predict the clinical outcome. So with the advanced uh, spinal MRI, the, with the uh, sequences used in like different tensor imaging, we have a better understanding of the anatomy and the physiology. Uh, and due to white matter to gray matter signal intensity ratio are all the biomarkers of the white matter injury. Now, the neurophysiological investigation is very, very important because it uh, gives an assessment of the diagnosis uh, and enables a longitudinal assessment as well as it uh, gives us the coexisting cervical radiculopathy and other neuromuscular diseases and it rules out all the peripheral neuropathy problems and it very precisely detects the damage to the anterior horn cells which is very commonly injured in cases of DCM. And the changes of the electrophysiologic assessment is important in a static uh, cord, as well as during the surgery. So the most commonly used are either SSEP or MEPs. And because it detects uh, the changes in asymptomatic, which is very important as well in the preclinical as well as in the subclinical cases, because it is very important to identify this pathology before the symptoms occur. So if these investigative modalities can detect these uh, subclinical or preclinical stages. It would be very nice to uh, prevent the injuries. So again, perioperatively, this uh, investigation mode is used to detect the injury before uh, it can cause damage. And there is another one is called the recording of the spinal thalamic pathway, where the central sensory nerve fibers are uh, detected if they are damaged. And this, uh, in short, is called CHIPS. It's more sensitive to damage uh, than SSEP. So we have to know about all this. So the electrophysical assessment is important in the asymptomatic and subclinical cases. And this gives us differential diagnosis, a long list of differential diagnosis, and all these investments in clinical radiological and neurophysiological uh, modalities allows us to differentiate DCM from all these differential diagnoses. And uh, now the, going for the natural history, actually natural history is very, very variable in DCM with a paucity of a high quality evidence. There are no high quality evidence that a patient with the DCM will proceed in in one direction. So there are long and shorter periods of exacerbation with an interspread long period of questions without new or worsening symptoms. So you can and mark by civil neurological status. So you so it is very, very difficult to predict what kind of course a uh, patient of with a DCM uh, takes. However, most substantial number would have a progressive stepwise decline of its function. Now if you go for the natural history was the article published in 2017 says 20 to 60% would have a neurological deficit in terms of MGOA score, and especially with the mechanism involves hyperextension. Now the reported rate of operation after uh, failure of a non-operative mechanism went from 40, 40 to 40%. 40 that means somebody you have started with the conservative management out of those 4 to 40% would ultimately need surgery. And 
it is even more if there is a circumferential uh, cord compression uh, in these cases. Now, this uh, figure, so, uh, this uh, table shows that uh, all those patients who are treated naturally or by conservative management, almost 60% would ultimately uh, would have surgery. And either or conservative management uh, would finally uh, have seen to undergo surgery. Uh, the challenges in the management is maintaining a current neurological status and prevent further deterioration. And the optimal treatment strategies and clinic care pathways have to be defined. The surgical decompression can improve neurological function, but, uh, uh, this, but there are many controversies on that. So mainly the management of DCM is operative and or non-operative. And there are many clinical uh, practice guidelines, recommendations, have come up with, uh, so you can see all these references uh, that have come across. And these are the tables which describe it. Uh, and to summarize the uh, finding of these studies and the table is that those with a moderate and a severe uh, cervical myelopathy would need surgical decompression. However, in mild myelopathy, it is not that clear, but the best strategy it remains unclear in this one, and there has to be a, supervi a supervised trial of a structured rehabilitation. And only in those, if there is a rapid uh, neurological deficit or they deteriorate neurologically, then surgery is advised. So even DCM classified as mild can be associated with substantial reduction in quality of life. So it is mild. And these patients, they may offer, they may demand, for surgery. So these are other non-operative management uh, which we all know about and these are the tables that uh, will uh, show us how many cases uh, uh, fail the non-operative management. It's usually it's given from uh, almost 20 to 40 percent and they require surgical intervention within a mean follow-up almost three to six years it is said. Now, diagnosis of DCM is a very expeditious referral for surgical assessment. That means even if you are managing a mild uh, cervical uh, degenerative myelopathy by conservative management, even then, this patient must be followed up by a surgical team for a possible uh, surgery in uh, future because uh, any deterioration in any very early signs of myelopathy has to be detected and managed there and then to prevent any permanent deficit. Now, uh, surgical management has been considered uh, for a progressive disease, the role of surgery being to halt the progression of neurological dysfunction and further disability. So it has to be a stepwise neurological decline with a variable period of questions. So the natural history, you have to be very careful. Now, the main uh, central point of an operative intervention is to elevate the mechanical compression and to fuse, fusion to reconstruct and stabilize the spine. And in most patients, it is effectively prevents progression of the deficit, improves functions, and there is improvement in the function and quality of life also. However, a minority of patients will have considered residual person of a disability and will continue to suffer. So, Again, summarizing the indication of surgery is that moderate to severe myelopathy, a progressive neurological deficit even in a mild uh, myelopathy in instability, which could be atrogenic or uh, due to the uh, degenerative process itself. So the risk might be determined by the molecular and cellular changes that occur in the surgical decompression. That means even after the surgery, there might be uh, deterioration. And this is uh, been attributed to the molecular and uh, cellular changes, and it has been found there is axonal and sprouting and restoration of the functional synapses that should take place after some surgical decompression and does not happen in all the cases. So other evidences are because of the reperfusion injury after decompression. However, there's a combining, so it is now advisable, combining surgical decompression with pharmacological agent that promote axonal plasticity, uh, provide a neuroprotection in an area of 
this is an area of active investigation. Now, there's a term, there's the agent called Rilu, uh, Rilujol, which is, uh, is coming up as a very effective neuroprotective agent. And it alters the excitatory neurotransmission by blocking the sodium and glutamate signal, which we talked about uh, a few slides in a, a few moments ago. So these are the area of uh, research and a probable intervention, uh, which is uh, in animal studies have shown very promising results. And uh, they're trying in the uh, human beings. There is a multi-center multi randomized controlled trial uh, uh, is going on uh, now at, at present. So to date, there are largest prospective investigation of clinical outcomes after decompression surgery is uh, are the AOSPINE uh, CSM North America and AOSPINE CSM International. These are the two very big uh, trials that have uh, taken place. Just to share with you, over the last 15 years, there are more than 1,800 papers that have been published uh, on DCM. It shows how the how serious, how big is the problem. And it is very reassuring that scientists are so serious about it, trying to find out the cause and the solution and reversibility of this one. So going for the operative management, which I'm not going to go in very detail, there are anterior posterior command approach. The factors that guide the choice of the surgical approach, there again, a randomized, randomized controlled trials uh, are going on currently on the way. And broadly, the anterior procedures are either cervical discectomy, fusion, uh, corpectomy and fusion, or a combined hybrid uh, discectomy. And the indications are suitable for restoring narrowness. And they address the predominant the ventral compressive pathology over a limited number of segments. Uh, likewise, posterior, you can have a laminectomy with instrumented fusion or a laminoplasty. Laminectomy alone, standalone laminectomy is hardly done these days. And the indication of multi level compression from predominantly or dorsal pathology. However, in a setting of OPLL, again, a posterior approach is done. And in a lot of cases, you they do anterior and posterior combined approach. Now, surgery significantly improves the long term, more than a year neurological function. In the short term, they may not, may not be much of a difference. Um, and there's an improvement in disability, and definitely there's a health-related quality of life also improves. There is greatest improvement in the moderate and the severe DCM at present. So even in cases of a severe DC, uh, DCM, there is a logic behind uh, of decompression and fixation of this spine. The cumulative incidence of complication was low, and surgery was uh, well tolerated. And it is surprising to me also to state that surgery is cost effective in the long run. So there is a Canadian uh, figure that's 11,000 per year quality adjusted last year. But in short, it is cost effective. Now the predictors of the outcome are age. We all know about symptoms duration, longer the duration, there is more damage, there is more, inf more inflammatory cytokines causing the damage. The pre-op uh, severity of the myelopathy, the curvature, and the deformity already been established. The diameter of the spinal canal is a very bad, I mean, narrow, the bad. The cause of compression is also very important. And the T2 signal uh, changes on MRI also predicts. And other ones are not very important. Con I mean, uh, it's more worse in female, they say. Uh, increase a job or a habit that increases movement of the head predisposes to this more. There are clinical features, specific sign and symptoms of upper motor neuron par uh, paralysis. Uh, they have got a worse prognosis, obese have got a worse prognosis, smoking and others we all know about. The changes in the MRI scene, uh, where uh, there's a low signal intensity T1 uh, come, uh, and a high signal in T2, uh, gives a bad prognostic sign because it shows a permanent damage, not an edema. Now, we and the researchers are. Uh, we I just want to talk about that microstructural MRI technique uh, gives a very good idea about the uh, 
uh, amount of the spinal cord injury in molecular levels also. So this would uh, give us a very good idea about the prediction of, of the outcome. And there are a lot of research, as I just mentioned, there are more than 1800 research and publications in the last 20 years. This graph, uh, this uh, shows that how many, how the uh, graph is going up in the last uh, years and is, in, is internationally doing. Unfortunately, uh, what we see is this, this uh, wall map shows that the dark blue are the ones where the most of the research are being done, uh, followed by the little less dark blue. and uh, even this and the white ones advancement where the new research has been done and unfortunately I think Nepal is in a very uh, dim blue one. I think we, we have our own data. Now, uh, sum, uh, summarizing BCM is characterized by a progressive neurological disability owing to age-related degeneration of the spinal column and resultant spinal cord compression. The physical and socioeconomic, socioeconomic burden of this display exposed to grow steadily as the uh, aged population grows in our community. The natural history of DCM is highly variable, but generally entails a progress. It is a progressive disorder. So at best, there is uh, worsening of neurological function. Surgical decompression is to halt the progression of the clinical deficit and improves a long-term neurological function, disability, and health-related quality of life. Severe permanent disability is prevented, preventable by early detection before a permanent damage occurs in the spinal cord and a due intervention. And important, it is our important social responsibility to recognize the signs and symptoms early of DCM and differentiate from those conditions that mimic DCM and apply the appropriate care. Now the future is that there are, we have to be involved in the multi-centered randomized control trials to shed light on the optimal choice of the surgical uh, approach uh, with a perioperative neuroprotective agent like uh, Riluzol acting on it. That means that means the surgery plus pharmacotherapy combined together might give us a better result. And although surgery has become the standard of care for moderate or severe myelopathy. The optimal treatment strategy for mild DCM remains to be defined. So it is still a contribution what to do with a mild one, especially those who have not a radiologic evidence of compression, but clinically the patient is okay. And uh, in the development, we have to develop a more sensitive outcome instrument to detect these uh, cases very, very early and to progress the progression of, to the myelopathy by probably a quantitative microstructural MRI technique and development of serological biomarkers and improved genetic analysis because there are so many genes that have been implicated. So, but however, so far, we have not got enough information on it. The burden of the problem of cervical uh, degenerative myelopathy is great and is underestimated the incidence and prevalence so far. It is ever growing with pain, disability, deformity, and deficit being its main uh, presentation. The pathogenesis and natural history is still working on. It is not yet uh, found out clearly. Early detection is very important using a clinical, radiological, and neurophysiological monitoring. The risk factors have to be defined more clearly, the genetic and environmental. And the treatment ultimately it has so far shown that ultimately most need surgery. But when is the still the question? Surgery has shown to improve the neurological outcomes, function status, and quality of life. The most important uh, challenging part in Nepal, I feel, is the education of self. That means all of us, you know, spine surgeons and neurosurgeons, other medical fraternity to detect this problem early and not to ignore the soft sign of myelopathy and quickly, as soon as uh, possible, to refer to the spine surgeon. And it is very, very important to educate the public also because we know there are a lot of publics who uh, have lived with this deformity and pain 
And even when they are detected, Cindy is not immediately life uh, threatening. They try to adjust avoiding the surgery, not knowing what they, the problem would ultimately lead to, kind of a disability and a deficit. Uh, and so the, I think it is our job to educate the public, ourselves, and the other medical fraternity. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Krishna, for a very enlightening talk, very comprehensive. And uh, you talked on the various details about what are the risk factors, how do you classify it clinically, the mild, moderate, and severe grade of myelopathy, uh, how to work up these patients, and how to differentiate these patients from other ailments which may mimic like myelopathy, and what are the different management. And of course, the research questions which are still uh, burning in the minds of a lot of researchers involved in this field. Um, well, uh, um, as you have rightly put in your presentation, there are three different pathogenesis uh, dealing with DCA. One is the mechanical compression, the other one was vascular comprom uh, compromise, and then the third one instability. So in your presentation, you did talk about uh, mechanical compression and the relief of the compression based on uh, uh, indicators by clinical or radiological marker. How do you make out about the vascular compression no, 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 no. and the instability part? Can you like to explain on that? Yeah, vascular uh, compromise is actually a part of the mechanical compression, uh, mainly because uh, along with the neural compression, there will be vascular compression. But along with the tonic uh, compression, there is always a hyalinization and thickening of the uh, vessel. So there is, uh, that way there is a uh, ischemia, a de decreased flow in the uh, uh, spinal uh, cord. I think uh, so far we only know the prevention. That means detecting uh, this pathology as early as possible with a soft sign of an open motor neuron type and decompressing. When we decompress the bony elements and the ligaments uh, of the spinal cord appropriately by the appropriate approach, I think we decompress the neural tissue as well as the vascular structures that will increase the uh, blood flow also. I think uh, I would be very happy if uh, anyone in the audience can further highlight uh, on this particular issue. Can I? Can can I Dr. Says, um, do you have any comments to make on um, this? Uh, yes, uh, on the questions that the question that you have raised, uh, dynamic compression. Uh, well, uh, we do not have. Uh, moment, but uh, there are patients who can be subjected to a dynamic uh, cervical spine MRI, uh, which would uh, give us idea about uh, dynamic compression. So uh, along with static compression, dynamic, dynamic compression also plays a role in this year. Okay, Dr. Krishna, there are a few questions uh, by, from the audience uh, I would like to put forward uh, here. So uh, there is a question from one of the audience who is asking about the electrophysiological study to diagnose and manage DCM. You have made a comment in your presentation that EPS can be used to diagnose and manage DCM. So can you opine on that? Uh, see, uh, there is for a sensory uh, neurophysiological uh, findings will detect as the compression on the cord by disruption of the neural, neurophysiological function of the spinal cord. Mainly the uh, anterior horn cells are damaged in uh, DCM. So uh, very particularly looking at the anterior horn cells uh, function in the neurophysiological study, plus uh, the spinothalamic tract which uh, uh, crosses. And the DCM usually affects the central, central part of the spinal cord. So these crossing fibers of the spinothalamic tract can be also uh, uh, detected by the neurophysiological test. Both of the anterior horn cells as well as the crossing fibers of the spinothalamic tract, if can be monitored correctly and uh, be detected, they can detect the cervical myelopathy or the damage to the spinal cord very early so that the appropriate uh, measures can be taken. And another very important uh, neurophysiological physiological advantage is uh, in the perioperative period, because I did not mention much about the about this particular aspect, because surgery part is by itself is a very big topic, 
So during positioning, uh, uh, before the surgery to uh, have a baseline, and uh, during positioning, there have been many, many, many incidents, incidences, which we knowingly, unknowingly increase the compression. And even though we do a beautiful decompression of surgery, the patient wakes up quadriplegic or a paraplegic that we all have experienced. So this uh, disaster can be, uh, I think, prevented by the neurophysiological. Well, uh, uh, this neurophysiological monitoring and uh, is really important. Well, apart from yes, that, yes, um, uh, Krishna, sir, there is another you role of EPS is to rule out other differential yes. diagnosis, yes. Uh, as yes, you have yes. rightly corrected, uh, correctly placed in your, in your uh, there's a list of differential diagnosis which can mimic like a DCM. So EPS in that scenario can be helpful. And apart it from is, uh, that, the other point that you raised was during the act of intubation. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Yeah, there is something called a double uh, cross syndrome. That is, somebody has got a cervical myelopathy as well as a carpal tunnel syndrome in almost 20 to 30 percent of the patients. So in these cases, uh, if we do a neurophysiological test and diagnose freehand that this particular patient has got a compression at the neck as well as in the cubital, uh, uh, sorry, in the um, uh, wrist. So both has to be decompressed before you can have the desired level. So thank you very much, uh, Amit. Yes, I missed that out in, uh, in explanation that it does rule out the other differential diagnosis uh, of like the peripheral compression as well as other medical problems also. Thank you. Yeah, yeah just to add to this, uh, like as you rightly put it, uh, during the and also patient will decent can deteriorate. So henceforth, um, um, in, uh, in our situation, we have made a policy of awake intubation in such scenarios to do away with these uh, type of uh, problems. However, awake intubation per se is not 100% um, uh, safe. And henceforth, it's always better to put on EPS before the intubation starts so that we can have an idea about the, uh, the compression uh, during the act of manipulation of the neck. Uh, well, uh, Gopal wants to speak uh, further on this topic. So Gopal, would you like to speak more? Can you please unmute yourself and talk here? Yes, exactly. That was my question. Whether any one of us is routinely using electrophysical studies preoperatively to diagnose and uh, to differentially diagnose the, the disease. Because uh, I have, in my opinion, it's not very useful to use electrophysical studies in every patient with the, uh, uh, cervical myelopathy because myelopathy diagnosing myelopathy with electrophysical studies I don't think it's a good idea. Well, Gopal, uh, just to add on to like just to have an explanation to what you just said. In fact, we use EPS only if in case we have <clears throat> doubtful uh, clinical scenario. A patient with uh, myelopathy uh, features in the legs, but then in the hands you, you look you are looking at uh, uh, low motor neuron features. Uh, in, in presence of a high cervical compression, we should not go along with that particular oh. diagnosis. So in, in those scenarios where, where you have dubious findings, a focal pathology hidden somewhere, so in that case, EPS does help, as uh, Dr. Krishna rightly put. Uh, so there's the next question here uh, from Dr. Gopal himself. He asks about um, if the patient has a DCM and a cord contusion, how would you counsel regarding the outcome? Krishna, sir. Yes, uh, I think uh, it is very, very at present to uh, uh, correlate the quantity of the myelopathy that is seen in this, uh, the uh, MRI in a cervical cord and to correlate with the clinical presentation <coughs> and the outcome ultimately. But I think at present what you can do is correlate the clinical and the radiological finding and uh, decompress as soon as possible and just I think uh, expect for the best. This is our limitation. There's a long way to go, but when there is a clinical and a radiological signs of myelopathy, I think uh, even if it is a mild one, I think the studies say uh, we have to decompress as soon as possible. The so, this uh, comment. With this comment, you are actually generating a little bit controversy here because uh, uh, as per the recent recommendation, what we all follow, 
moderate and severe myelopathy is not a problem. There's a uh, yeah. the uh, dearth of there's a lot of evidence which actually supports uh, surgical decompression. Yeah. The problem is with the uh, with the mild grade myelopathy, or in other words, asymptomatic myelopathy, where the MRI does show some uh, radiological features of myelopathy, but then the patient's on clinical examination uh, just only shows increase in the reflexes, but then there's nothing else uh, for clinical um, uh, support of myelopathy. So in that scenario, would you like to go ahead with the surgical decompression immediately? See, the answer is not very straightforward like this. We'll have to consider the overall situation. If a patient with a mild myelopathy can be followed up regularly, if the patient can understand what are the consequences of waiting, and if he can be relied upon, then probably we can wait for the, uh, we continue with the conservative management and uh, follow up in uh, regular follow up. But however, if the patient you think will not come back, uh, again, you will not understand, will not detect the deterioration of the neurological deficit, and probably uh, uh, you have ruled out the other, other causes, I think you'll have to use your judgment and wisdom to counsel that patient towards the surgery. Thank you. Yeah, Gopal, you'd like to say something. Uh, Dr. Amit, can I add something? Uh, yeah, yeah, Dr. Prabhupin. Yeah, yeah. please go ahead. Uh, first of all, uh, Krishna, thank you very much for your nice uh, presentation and good recapitulation on this uh, cervical myelopathy. Well, um, just my view, uh, as far as surgical decompression is concerned, I usually prefer moderate cases more, more than uh, the severe cases, because moderate cases are very good in terms of output, uh, outcome, uh, if the surgery goes well, and the patient becomes better immediately after surgery, same evening or maybe the next day, uh, because most of the cases in uh, moderate uh, cases are uh, reversible, <clears throat> unlike severe cases. In case of severe cases, since it is already a you know, case of uh, severe myelopathy, patient usually doesn't improve even though we do the significant decompression and patient may think they haven't improved and there was no use of surgery. Basically in severe cases, surgery is basically preventive to prevent the further worsening of the myelopathy rather than curing whatever, you know, the problem they have already developed. So personally, I feel moderate cases are more rewarding. And my query, another query uh, is uh, regarding this OPLL. Uh, well, personally, I have come across only very few cases of OPLL so far. And whenever there is OPLL, I usually tend to go posteriorly uh, because OPLL are usually multi-segment and it's difficult to go anteriorly at times and even sometimes may produce significant surgical complications. So my query is how often have you come across such cases of OPLL and how you, what is your policy uh, to decompress such cases? Yeah, first question, uh, the first uh, comment you made about uh, moderate and severe is that uh, I mean, if it's possible, of course, uh, the moderate uh, cervical myelopathy would have a better result, definitely. But what has been shown by the study is the short-term uh, benefit or the short-term assessment is not much of a difference between conservative and uh, surgical one. But long-term, like eight years, 10 years after the decompression of even the severe uh, myelopathy have shown a better result in terms of the modified GOA score compared to the conservative one and as well as uh, not only the because uh, what we might have uh, experienced is that a, a, a symptom but this symptom might have affected initially one part of the limb but if you continue conservative management in a severe one then it will slowly affect the other limb uh, probably the lower limb probably the bladder bowel. So since it is a progressive uh, disease, yeah, and you rightly true. said it is mostly a preventive one, so I think there's always an advantage of uh, uh, surgical decompression. Yeah. But I'm yeah. sure, yeah. but most important that you have to explain it to the yeah. uh, uh, patient and the relatives, what is the real intention of the surgery. Exactly. Sorry, the second question was on, I'm sorry. Uh, what was the question? OPL. Yes, yes. OPLL. The policy yeah, how commonly you have come across yeah. and what is your policy? Yeah. Now, OPLL, uh, of course, not, not much, but uh, uh, when there is more than three segments involved, 
the guideline is to go posteriorly and uh, there's a lot of papers about laminoplasty in OPLL more than three levels also but there is also one other mechanism of action where the OPLL continues to continues to grow if you don't fix the spine if there is a, the uh, progression of the OPLL continues if you don't fix the spine and make it stable so my policy for more than three level is always go posteriorly, do a wide laminectomy, and do a transpedicular or a lateral mass fixation. However, uh, one segment, uh, two two level this with a uh, in between uh, OPLL, I would rather go anteriorly decompress and uh, do a do a grafting there. Uh, Thank you. One question, uh, Dr. Gopal, you want to say something? Dr. Gopal, you were raising the hand. No, no, I have, I have put it down. <laughs> okay. Uh, there is okay. one, one so, more question. So, uh, just to Dr. add on Neelam. it. Yeah, Pratish, you can read the questions, please. Uh, Dr. Neelam wanted to ask uh, a question in two parts. Uh, the first question was, how would you choose the approach? anterior and posterior and in posterior uh, the dip, uh, when you choose uh, laminectomy and when laminoplastic is uh, sorry Krishna sir uh, uh, if you go by the books by the research they are still working on the right uh, indication for anterior and posterior so broadly speaking short segment anterior uh, uh, completion have to be go anteriorly for example one or two level days with the intervening uh, vertebral uh, completion by the vertebral body i would to go anteriorly but uh, more than two level uh, three, more than three three or more than three level uh, completion of the days i would go posteriorly i'm not very fond of uh, laminoplasty as i uh, not I'm not very comfortable about uh, decompression. That is my personal opinion. But a uh, lot of, most of the Japanese uh, spine surgeons do laminoplasty. But I still would, uh, I still prefer to do a wide laminectomy and a fixation, correcting the alignment as well as, as, well as uh, stabilizing the spine. Uh, Nilam, can, does that answer your query, please? Yeah, thank you very much for your answer. Uh, you know, lamino, yes, you are right. In Japan, uh, almost every case they do laminoplasty, and they have also devised laminoplasty baskets, and uh, they are very fond of these laminos, laminoplasty baskets. Uh, oh, but uh, in our scenario, it's not, uh, you are right, that it's not uh, absolute necessary to do laminoplasty, uh, in, my, in my opinion, too. Uh, but uh, as far as fixation is concerned, uh, do you fix uh, every cases or you choose uh, you choose the cases to fix? Uh, definitely, I mean uh, theoretically you can check the stability preoperatively and on table and uh, and decide on that. But in practice. Uh, I don't take the risk because I do a very wide laminectomy in this so that a complete decompression is done. And on doing that, uh, there is always an atrogenics because I'll be removing the ligaments. I disturb the facets also. Mostly. And uh, in one of my trainings, the, one of the professors has shown me to fuse the facet joint by curating the facet joint. So I would be disturbing the facet joints also. So. Uh, I would prefer to do a fixation in uh, cervical myelopathy, uh, degenerative cervical myelopathy. So I would like to prefer. Yeah. And oh, secondly, oh. Uh, the yeah. outpatient will not give another chance, I think. That is one of the things. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you may be right. Uh, a question I'd uh, want to add on to this, Krishna sir. Like uh, at times we are faced with uh, instances when we uh, are treating old age patients. So, uh, is there any cutoff age limit beyond which you would just do a laminectomy and uh, not think of using or? 
Yes, I mean, uh, actually, uh, we are still talking about is in Nepal. But when I'm sure you all, we all must be attending the webinar, and they're operating on 98, 99, 92 years, and fixing the spine, sometimes anterior and posterior D. So I think uh, rather than the age, the fitness of surgery uh, might be the more deciding factor, uh, uh, whether to fix or not to fix, and the pathology also. Because we don't know how long a person is going to live. We cannot, I think, so if possible, if possible, I think we should fix it and give them the best chance. Um, Dr. Mohans, so do you like to yes. have a comment on this? You are very patiently listening to the newer advances in spine surgery. Unfortunately, <laughs> I am not keeping up with the, uh, what is going on in spine. But again, getting back, that, that answer from Professor Krishna was for OPLL or for general, you know, Cervical spondylitic myelopathy. So every patient you do laminectomy, you diffuse. Is that what Krishna you said? No. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, uh, long, uh, long level uh, laminectomy, a uh, wide laminectomy. Uh, okay. I would add, uh, prefer to fix that. A short segment hey, probably not. Yes. No, I know. So, so only only yesterday, levels. our guys. Hey, I'm Amit. Yeah, so Amit Gopal. That patient, we just operated two days ago. That patient with three level lami go you in Amle. We did not fuse. Is there no, any really. reason to have three level? The patient had compression from anteriorly also, compression from posteriorly also. And that patient went into isolation, all this COVID thing all. You know? Eventually, PCR was negative. Then we took him to surgery and decided to go from posteriorly because entirely three three fourth yoga level say. so you have a three level laminectomy garepachi you suggest doing instrumentation oh yes sir i i would do that but i'm otherwise probably probably i mean uh, just uh, on the basis of this much of information may not i might not be able to give you a very yeah, sure, answer. sure 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 uh, i may need more information on that but uh -huh. with this limited uh, information, I think uh, we'll have to judge whether atrogenic or by the pathology itself is uh, uh, will okay. we make the spine unstable because we will not later on it will be unstable. Like that. Yes, sir. Yes, okay. Yes, sir. okay. 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 Thank you. With, uh, Thank you. Sir, sir, just to add on this, just to add on this, basically, if the patient has anterior and posterior uh, compression in in the case which mm. you are mentioning, mm. patient should mm. also have his dead. Uh, Joints and all other uh, like uh, um, uh, joint surfaces degenerated. In that sense, if in mm. case you are doing a wide laminectomy at three levels, mm. then it becomes unstable. Mm. So, yeah. but even if you don't talk the fascia joints, so there are a lot of reports where only doing, yeah, but then they are already degenerated. So since they are already okay. de degenerated in okay. in the cases of DCM, so okay. they will not be able to take the axial loads. Uh, plus, okay. uh, since no, well, now we have taken away the posterior elements, so already the middle comp component is uh, degenerated, the posterior element is gone, so the anterior okay. elements cannot hold these particular bones for on, in that single yeah. alignment. So chances of instability okay. is far more higher. So as okay. Dr. Krishna was putting up in his first slide of pathogenesis, the three pathogenesis, mm. mechanical compression, in mechanical instability, mm. and vascular compromise, mm. all needs to be mm. taken care of whenever we are dealing with ECM. Uh, okay. Well, uh, Dr. Krishna, in one of your slides, you have mentioned the smoking as not a factor of uh, affecting the outcome of these patients. But then, uh, as you're putting forward in most of the patients, uh, we are nowadays going ahead with fusion. And the smoking does have an effect on fusion to such an extent that many clinics in North America do not operate on a space spine patients if they have not quit smoking. So, what do you have to comment on this? Does the smoking is to be in a prohibited in all these patients? If in case they are being considered for surgery, yeah, I think so. Yes, I mean, uh, smoking is known to uh, uh, cause uh, exacerbation of the degeneration, and it will continue after the surgery also. And besides that, there are so many uh, factors that are bad factors that are correlated with smoking, and uh, scientifically also, uh, it's a bad prognosticating sign. So I would. Uh, Ensure that the patient smokes, uh, stops smoking before he subjects that particular patient to surgery. Yes. Okay. Thank you. 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 Th
Yeah, Pratish, please uh, read the question. Dr. Dr. Yam has a question like uh, uh, any complications of instrumentation in old age patients as the patient's bone is already osteoporotic? Uh, yes, uh, uh, the, um, of course, osteoporotic bones have got a, it's a totally a different, uh, I mean, has to be considered. Uh, so probably there are ways of cement augmentation and longer screw there is with improving the instrumentation in osteoporotic uh, bones also uh, by modifying the instrumentation using a supplementary bone cement to make the uh, implant and the purchase stronger uh, in osteoporotic spine. So if you feel the, you feel that the screws are not going to hold, probably you'll have to modify the instrumentation as a technique also. But you have to do it. Instruments, when you have to do it, you have to do it. Thank you. Okay, um, if there are no questions, then uh, it's already, we are crossing this one hour time. So mm. uh, should I close this, Dr. Krishna? Uh. Any other Dr. questions, please? Dr. Dr. Amit, my small humble suggestion. We can put yeah. up, you know, some interesting yeah, please, cases sir. here please, also. Please. It's part of the webinar. Just mm -hmm. like, you know, we could have actually brought mm -hmm. that X-ray, uh, that MRI, and we could have gotten your opinion, expert opinion. So it's part of the, you know, this presentation. We can bring interesting cases here to be shared by everybody. And people can give comment on, you know, the treatment plan that would be a great idea on the relevant topic so sorry, interesting my presentation here was, you're commenting and dr neelam has already put up uh, put up his note here so dr neelam khatka is presenting the next webinar on thoracolumbar uh, fractures on the next saturday uh, uh -huh. this is not the next webinar it's basically the next saturday's webinar where he will be discussing on interesting cases so yes. Dr. Neelam is ready with all this interesting case. <laughs> okay. So thank you everyone for a very lively participation. And um, thank you, Dr. Krish uh, Krishna Sharma. He has done a very good job as usual. We are very proud of our president. And uh, he has uh, created yes. uh, um, um, a, a very good lecture where we, can, uh, we are very much knowledgeable by his uh, inputs. Uh, just before we uh, leave out, um, there are two things I need to comment. One is the research which we are talking about since uh, all the members have seen that for the last few weeks, we have been talking much more research. And the spine research actually depends upon outcome measures. So if we can start in all our institutions using a modified GOS scale or ODI indexes, NURIX grade, SF36 questionnaires for outcome measures, then definitely our research will be much more authentic and we can put forward in the national literature. And there is a recent ongoing trial, which is called Record DCM by Michael Felling from uh, Toronto, Canada. Uh, if in case uh, our centers can do a multinational collaboration with these particular trials, it will be a good sort of collaboration in international level. So with this words, uh, I'd like to thank all of you and uh, like to certainly invite you again for a Wednesday meeting at uh, uh, 6 p.m. onwards. And that will be on peer review to be presented by me and moderated by Dr. Resha and Dr. Rupender. And then the next week will be Dr. Neelam Karka's uh, uh, Neelam Kumar Manav's uh, presentation on thoracolumbar fracture. Uh, so look forward to have you all again there and have a safe stay, safe uh, work at the places. Uh, be uh, safe. Uh, yeah. Can I? Can I? Uh, uh, I'd like yes, to thank sir. you everybody yes, yes, for their, for your patience. Uh, I know. Like I don't know. During my rehearsal, I thought the presentation would go longer. So I actually did. I was thinking of putting up a few illustrations. So I thought I would not have much of time, so I did not put. Uh, I'd very uh, like to appreciate your patience hearing. Um, Thraco lumbar fracture, there is a webinar from the spine, uh, WFNA spine committee tomorrow. So I'll share the link. I think it is uh, very important that we can uh, participate in that Thraco lumbar. Uh, uh, it's a consensus meeting. So uh, that will, I think, uh, make us more prepared to listen to Dr. Neelam's uh, presentation next week and fire him with more questions. Thank you very much. And please stay safe and stay fine. Thank you very much. Thank you, Entas, for thank the you. support. And thank you, everyone. See you next week.